Hey you guys, this is Raphael from ShilohRelics.com. I hope y'all doing well. I hope everything's pointing your direction. <clears throat> Forgive me, I'm a little uh, chugged up this morning. We had a great show in Dalton, Georgia last weekend, but I think I talked to everybody in the world down there and I'm very thankful to get to go to a show again. We uh, had a great show down there. The numbers uh, were very strong. A lot of attendance, a lot of wonderful things, and I got a bunch of stuff that I'm going to be taking pictures of and putting on ShilohRelics.com in the next little bit, including this. By the time you see this video, it will be on the website. You better order it quick because it won't last long. Uh, but got a world of things. Uh, it was great to be back at a show again. Hadn't done one uh, in a while. Good to see all my friends. Um, there were several of them that traveled from Wisconsin and Virginia and New York. So it was great to see everybody again. Uh, all my friends that were heading back east, I hope you made it through that snowstorm and are safe and sound and snug in your, in your house today. <clears throat> we're gonna talk about a piece that I think is so interesting because it's what um, the regular fighting man on the Confederacy was wearing if he was lucky enough to have one in the early days of the war. When the war broke out, the Confederacy had to make all of their equipment. There were very well-crafted pieces. There were pieces that were brought in from England that were jeweler quality. I mean, just wow, pretty, pretty stuff. And then there was stuff that was made locally and some of it was well-made. A lot of those pieces around Richmond was were very well-crafted. And then you had the ones that were smaller local shops that produced pieces that just did not have the ability. They might've had the skill, but they did not have the ability and the machinery to create really beautiful pieces. But they had functionality and, or, or they got the job done. This is one of those get the job done for a while kind of pieces. Early days of the war, nobody thought it would last four years. <laughs> they, both sides were convinced that after three months, everybody would just say, screw it, we'll go home, everything will be fine. And it didn't quite work out that way. One of the belt buckles that they made is referred to by collectors as the Confederate egg buckle. Why would you call it an egg buckle? Look at the, at the shape of this. It's oval like an egg, but it's also thin, 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 thin stamped brass. And it's stamped brass. It's kind of interesting with these. It, when you see them in non-excavated condition like this, a lot of times they'll have a red tone to them. What, what's that for? It's because the metal has a lot of copper in it. It's brass and copper mixed together. Why would you do that? Um, and if you reference Mullinax's book, Steve did a great book, uh, Miss You Buddy. Uh, he did a great book. He mentions in there that red brass is the, the mixture of that is easier to stamp than, than just straight pure brass. Because these were easy to stamp, you didn't, the firm didn't have to hit them as hard. A lot of times the, the die work isn't as crisp as they are on a lot of the other buckles. This one, the letters are nice and clear and we refer to it as the egg. There's two different main versions of the egg buckle. There's one that shows up widely issued in the 1862 Army of Tennessee campsites. Most of those look like this. Why do they look like that? Because they were just a piece of thin red brass that broke very easily. They, and you can see this one has some waves to it. Check out that. That's because when it's on a soldier's uh, waste and he's moving and working. You can imagine it would be easy to bend something, much less if you're taking it on and off. So most of them you see are uh, one of two things. They're broken up like this or they're lost. Because if he got a chance to replace this buckle, he replaced it in a heartbeat with one of those real pretty solid cast CSAs that were solid as a rock and you wouldn't have that problem with. <clears throat> The uh, one that they believe is made before that Army of Tennessee, 1862, don't know this for sure, but they believe it is, is the lead-filled version. 
And collectors have always referred to that as the Virginia style because the majority of those have been found up in what was referred to as the Eastern Theater of Operations, which means Virginia in that area. There's a quick way to tell. All you gotta do is, uh, the face looks basically the same. Flip it over. If it's got lead in it, it's the Virginia version. If it's just got the hooks or what, where the hooks were, the remnants of the solder on the back, it's the Tennessee style. This one is the Virginia style. And <clears throat> the hooks, another thing about these that's really, really cool. Uh, a few years ago, we actually found the letter where they had the order for the wire to go in these hooks. What would that have been off of? It's telegraph wire. They actually use telegraph wire to make the hooks on the back of this buckle. How neat is that? And I had a copy of that and I looked around, tried to find it because I was gonna put it up here because I thought, I got that, I'll be able to find it. Nope, it's in my office somewhere. Uh, but it, they were using telegraph wire to make the hooks on them. The belts on these will vary. Usually they're just a simple, uh, uh, most of the time pigskin, not always pigskin, sometimes black leather, but you see them a couple of different ways. This one is really, really neat. When you look at it, it's got that well-worn look, but there's a reason why it is well-worn look. It was used twice. The soldier used it. Uh, evidently, the belt that came on it originally was lost. If you need your britches held up, what are you going to do? Just walk around with your britches falling down? Nope. You're going to go find you another piece of leather. <clears throat> if you're a soldier, where's uh, another piece of leather that you might get your hands on? The cartridge box sling. If you notice, it's got two slits where at one time there was an eagle uh, plate on there. And so he probably captured a Yankee belt, a Yankee cartridge box, trimmed it down and used it as a belt. How do you know it wasn't done last Thursday? Look at the markings around the place where you put the tongue of the buckle in and it's got different size markings. So you can tell this one was used. This wasn't done last Thursday. The cat put this on this belt and wore the hell out of it. Cause look at the adjustment notches. You can tell how much uh, food he got too, which ones uh, he had to adjust it and, and loosen it and tighten it. <clears throat> it's just a cool plate. They've always been one of my favorites. If you find one of those that was excavated and broken up, a lot of times they're restored I'm all for restoration as long as you know it and it's priced accordingly. It's your easiest and least uh, affordable way to get an original Confederate belt buckle. So I like them. It gives a chance for somebody that doesn't have $30,000 like all of us when we start or even in advanced things. So you can have a real Confederate belt buckle without spending uh, 20, 30 grand. This one is on ShilohRelics.com by the time you watch this video. I want to say thank you. We did have a great show. Uh, while we were down there, noticed there were a lot of faces missing. We had uh, several that, were, that were, were gone, either afraid to come out because of the virus, uh, taking care of family and friends, didn't want to take a chance of getting it. And several of them had passed over the years. So I want to take a second just to remember some of those guys that... Uh, were big influences to me that weren't there because the influence was, and uh, we we missed them. I think we've all lost uh, s several people over the last year, and, and for some reason this year, when you lose somebody, whether it's from being 94 or from COVID or cancer or anything else, it's just felt a little heavier. Uh, I've missed <laughs> a lot of people. Uh, we're, we're fortunate that we have the memories that we have. I, I know I'm rambling today, but it just, sometimes you have so many things on your mind, it's just hard to focus on one, but there've been a lot of loss and that's what I've had on my mind. And, and so I am gonna keep a good thought for everybody that has lost somebody today, that if you've lost somebody, um, you ain't alone. <laughs> sometimes it feels like people forget. They don't forget. Uh, the when I lost Lori back years ago, oh God, I was having a hard time. And I went to, told this story before. So if you watch the rest of them, you can zone out and I'll see you next time. But uh, I was having a hard time. Lori was my wife. We were married 23 years. 
and I, I just had a hard time, felt, felt like I had a hard time breathing. And, and I went to a casino in Tunica, Mississippi, and I was sitting there and I was talking with the dealer. Lucky nobody was there having to listen to it. She was getting paid for it, so I didn't feel so bad. But we were talking and she says, well, when I lost my brother, my grandma told me, she said, child, you'll, you'll never get over it, but you'll learn to live with it. And those words saved me. It's odd how you get wisdom sometimes from places you ain't expecting. And I did in a blackjack table in Tunica, Mississippi. And uh, so we're going to get through it. We'll, we'll never get over it, but we'll learn to live with it. And if we learn to live with it, we can make each day a little bit better. And I hope yours is better because I want the best for everybody out there. Hope y'all have a great day. I hope you remember your love. I hope if you get the opportunity that you are a positive light in somebody's life because everybody needs a little light. Catch you next time. Love you guys.